Rachel's now back on U.S. soil after her very first trip to Afghanistan, where among other things, she got a tour of the capital city, Kabul, and a chance to ask the head of the Southern Command, who is spearheading the current counterinsurgency offensive, exactly how troops on the ground feel about the abrupt change at the top of the U.S. military command in Afghanistan. Do you have a sense of how people feel about General Petraeus coming back, General McChrystal leaving? Um, there's, there's three parts to that. First, uh, General McChrystal is somebody, uh, he and his wife, that thousands of people in the Army have known for a long time and uh, you know, not only personally admire him but have professional res respect for him as a professional soldier. Nobody's sacrificed more than him, certainly over this, he and his wife, over these last several years. Uh, I thought the way the President very uh, appropriately acknowledged that when he made his announcement uh, was appreciated. Uh, I certainly appreciated it. Um, uh, sad to see what happened to General Crystal. But that's done. Uh, soldiers are not sitting around wringing their hands. I mean, they're very busy. I know this is a, a difficult question, but if over the next year it doesn't, essentially doesn't work to establish better governance in Kandahar, if the uh, police efforts, the policing efforts, security efforts, uh, don't combine to create enough space for Afghan government to step up in a way that is working. I don't get the sense that there's a plan B. Is there a plan B? Um, is plan B just more time? Is... There's no reason why this shouldn't be successful if the Afghans do their part. I mean, we have... I, I've never met an officer that didn't want more capability, so I would never turn away more engineers or more military police, but we have enough to do uh, what we have got to do in Kandahar, assuming that the Afghans step up and do their part. If they don't? Uh, well, then I, we, will have, we will have given them the best chance they've ever had. So we're in a neighborhood now called Wazir Akbar Khan, um, talking about the distribution of wealth. Uh, in Kabul and the effect of... There is no the, distribution the, of wealth. This is no where it's distributed. <laughs> this is where it, it ends up. All of the money from contracts and association with the government and association with the U.S. military has ended up here. Why? Because this was originally, as you can see, the, 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 there's no real pavement or anything yeah. like that. This was originally just empty land. Okay. And when the Americans came in with the Northern Alliance... The Northern Alliance, which was the Allies, who against the Taliban, right. took this land and then gave it away to all their cronies. Oh, okay. So they created a new created wealth a neighborhood out of nothing. Exactly. And so we still got open sewers, and we've still got no pavement, but we have Rococo castles, nouveau riche that castles. rent for ten to twenty-five thousand dollars a month because it's a safe area. But here's the irony. Most of the government officials, and these are almost all owned by government officials, don't live in them. They rent them out to foreign companies, contractors, and they live in Dubai or have their families in Islamabad. So they are purely investment property. I, mean, I think this neighborhood is actually very symbolic of, of a lot of the problems with this entire war, frankly. And here, next to an incredibly big house is a open garbage pile because no one cares about the common space. Nobody, it's not anybody's problem. This corner is like the microcosm of the war. This, and this, and, and these the kids. reason, and us too, because we're here as Americans covering this because of the American initiative here um, that created the economy that made this all possible. We are uh, here on Chicken Street, uh, as you can, or approaching Chicken Street, the Chicken Street District. Exactly. As you can tell, uh, suited up again. Um, everybody always says this is where the tourists come. I've never had the opportunity to buy a carpet with guns on it before, and I'm not sure when I'll have huh? it again. I mean, unless I hang out with you, which huh? is it'll come up all the time. Have yeah, enough $20? All right. Good. This is twenty dollars as well. This is yeah. like this one. Yeah. Same as this. My mom's gonna be really excited. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you. All right. Have a nice day. You don't have a gun carpet. I don't have a gun carpet. You know what? You were even twenty-five dollars. I'll give you for that gun carpet right now. I'm asking you like five questions about it. You're still ready to leave. You still can't even grok the fact that I would want to buy it. I I was shocked. I have been shocked. I've never seen anyone buy one of those. Here? This one? Like, okay, like this? Like this? 
Ok, perfect. Senor. And you can start. This is, I took the safety it's, off. It's, a, it's ready. I think I'm a bad shot. Good. Are you okay? Help me. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Did I hit you with a uh, cartridge? Oh, I'm good. I'm, I'm already sorry. fired. So thank you. <laughs> Much more from Rachel's trip to Afghanistan when she returns next week. And this programming note, Rachel will be a guest on Meet the Press this Sunday. Check your local listings. If they still exist, you should probably just Google it. That does it for us tonight. I'm Chris Hayes in for Rachel. She'll be back Monday. You can read more of my work at thenation.com. Follow me on Twitter, username Chris L. Hayes. Have a great weekend. Thank you so much for watching, and good night.